Hello and welcome to Nordic Labour Film Festival's fourth edition. And today we, we will uh, talk about uh, how to organize uh, radical filmmakers or uh, the filmmakers who work with uh, labor issues or the issues what we are bringing into the labor film festivals. So today uh, with us we have Steve uh, from uh, from his uh, assistant uh, professor or lecturer in Bristol uh, University. And also he's a founder of Radical Film Network. And also uh, we're going to talk about his new book, uh, the book about, about uh, contemporary radical film, cultural network and organization and activism. And that uh, is directly relevant to the Radical Film Network and how, and how we can actually learn from... Uh, Steve's experience and from this book and Radical Film Network, how we can actually uh, organize some similar kind of things or networks in Sweden and in Nordic. So uh, welcome, Steve. Hey, yeah. thanks very much. Yeah. So, uh, well, I'm uh, very excited to, uh, to see your book, actually. I mean, this, this is actually... It's based on Radical Film Network, basically, what you have done. And then it's now you want to present, actually, uh, what is the I mean, what is the results of Radical Film Network, basically? Yeah. So, yeah, the book did, the book did come out of, out of the network. Um, I think one of the frustrating things for me about the book is that it can never be the network in its... The network is much bigger than you could ever fit in one book. I think we've already... There's like 200 and something organizations in the network already from like i can't remember how many countries 30 something countries around the world so it's like the network is like grown way bigger than we ever kind of dreamed really when we when we thought when we thought we'd try and um set it up so so the book um da -da -da, oh, there you go. Uh, 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 yeah so um it, i think one of the things we really tried to do <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay is uh <laughs> Is really try and do justice to some of that, some of the diversity in the network, um, and to yeah, to show okay. off like some of the different. Okay. What what what, um, what you have idea behind? I mean, already you have explained some, but I mean, what is what is your mind? And yeah. uh, obviously, you are the one of the editor. Who are the others? Um, so yeah, so 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 yeah. When I say when you introduce it as my book, <laughs> no. I I, uh, I wrote well, it. Yeah. I, I'm one of three editors. So there's a whole bunch okay. of different chapters in there. From I think we've got about 20 chapters in the book, um, and then there's three editors that kind of help pull it all together. So myself, um, Professor Mike Wayne at Brunel University in London, and uh, and Dr. Jack Newsinger, uh, who is at um, the University of Nottingham. Um, I think we've we've all been involved in the network since the start, pretty much. Um, I'm pretty sure they have. And we just, we really felt it was time to try and do a kind of a publication that brought together, um, you know, a, 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 a taster of how kind of diverse and eclectic uh, contemporary radical film culture is. Because there hasn't been a book that does that um, for some time. Um, and maybe I, I'm not aware of another publication, actually, that tries to do that on, a, on that has the sort of same global scope but also tries to think about radical film in terms of formal radicalism, um, political radicalism, um, geographic radicalism, but also uh, radical film activity that's not just production, that includes film production, but which also includes um, distribution, archives, uh, radical film history, uh, radical exhibition practices. There's a whole range, a whole section on film festivals and interrupted screenings and, and all kinds of things like that. So, so we really wanted to think about ra this kind of radical film as a holistic thing. So from every sort of bit of the production chain, so production, distribution, exhibition, and everything in between. Um, and that's sort of what the Radical Film Network is all about as well. So people tend to think like, oh, the Radical Film Network, that must be for filmmakers. Well, like, yeah, it totally is. But it's also for all the other people that are involved in it, writers, curators, uh, academics, researchers, you know, <coughs> organisers, activists, um, artists, 
co- collectives, all everyone basically who's involved in any aspect of like socially or politically or aesthetically um, uh, innovative and experimental moving image. Now, of course, it's, it's uh, I mean, Radical Film Network is focused on the whole global. I mean, it's not only one, but what is your focus basically? Area, my, country? Yeah, well, I mean, my, my area of sort of expertise is, is, is within the UK. So I'm most familiar with, with the UK really. And I think, you know, we tried really hard to get a, a good range of perspectives from, uh, from outside the UK. Uh, but I think it is inevitably, you know, because of, of uh, you know, all the, the editors have been based in are based in in England. So uh, you know, inevitably, it's sort of um, UK slash Euro centric to a degree. But we've also got chapters in there on India, uh, Cameroon, Greece, Morocco, Palestine, Israel, um, North and South America, Spain, China is in there. The um, uh, queer film festival, Beijing queer film festival. Um, so, so we tried really hard to get that kind of international diversity, but, um, but yeah. So, but in terms of my focus, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess like where I'm most active really has been within the UK, I suppose. But I mean, one of the things about the RFN that's been so lovely is seeing it grow and develop. And over the last maybe three or four years, it's really taken a kind of international turn. So we've got um, people, uh, a couple of people across India setting up um, sort of divisions or, or chapters or uh, uh, or iterations of the Radical Film Network um, in India. And there's RFN Berlin is going to have its second event next year. That was massive last year. Um, uh, so so it's and then of course like uh, uh, in in Sweden, uh, the Radical Film Network developing there. So it's really exciting to see it kind of um to grow it see it growing internationally and to see that there's a need for a radical film network not just in the uk where it started but all around the world yeah good uh, okay I've, if i come to your articles or your research what you manage uh, or like uh, publish in this what is admin will make or break the rebellion can you tell us oh, yeah. what it is yeah yeah sure so that's so um so that's the chapter, the title of my chapter. So admin will make or break the rebellion, um, and then the subtitle is building the radical film network. And it's it's sort of a reflection on um, where the net where the network came from, um, why we decided to set it up, and what the challenges have been. So, and I think one of the important things about writing that history is because it's quite rare for radical organizations to be able to kind of document their own history and think about themselves as in a kind of historical way at the same time as doing their activist work whatever it might be um and i think that's so 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 actually one of the problems and one again one of the reasons we set the network up was because contemporary kind of activists or other find it harder to then access their own history so you find that you know new generations of cultural activists quite often might not necessarily be aware of the historical precedents that kind of came before them and so one of the things with the rfn was like absolutely about like well let's let's set this network up but let's actually let's really recognize that we're coming after this amazing organization in britain in in the uh, 70s, 80s, and, and 90s called the Independent Filmmakers Association, which the IFA, which was the kind of radical film network, if you like, which was a radical film network, uh, set up in 1974 and ran until 1990 and did amazing things. And so we were like, you know, I my job is a I'm an academic. I teach film studies and I'm a kind of cultural historian. Uh, and I was researching this history of radical film in Britain and you found out quite a lot about the IFA and was like, Oh my God, this is awesome. We really need a radical film network now. Uh, it was something to do what the IFA was doing then today. Cause there wasn't one, you know, everyone was quite like spread out and didn't know what everyone else was doing. And, um, and a lot, a lot of the people that were working, you know, uh, in radical film culture, um, today in, in the UK weren't, didn't necessarily know about the IFA. So it was like, well, look, we've got to try and connect these generations up. Let's try and rekindle the spirit of the IFA for the digital era, if you like. Um, so anyway, so my chapter talk, sort of talks about 
talks about that, talks about some of the challenges that we faced in setting the network up, um, some of the key ideas behind it. Um, and yeah, uh, and then some of the, some of the, like where, where I think it might go, some of the problems we've had, um, kind of with one eye thinking about how, you know, people that might be thinking about, well, like, you know, we should try and get networked as well, trying to like, write an account of the last seven years from my point of view and say, well, look, this is maybe, this was our experience and maybe you can learn from it um, and not make the mistakes that we made. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we must be doing something right because the network is just growing and growing and growing. So That sounds very interesting. Okay, um, and uh, the, the next chapter of your research on, on Morocco, third cinema in Morocco, what we learned or what is, uh, you're following, I think, for a long time, Morocco. Or, uh, or yes, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm a kind of uh, enthusiast about third cinema. I think um, it's what um, Nadir is, is doing in, in Morocco is, is really interesting, a you know, contemporary incarnation of third cinema. I think quite often when we talk about third cinema, um, people, you know, rightly think about, you know, Latin America and Africa in the 60s and 70s and, you know, the Arrow of the Furnitures and all of that um, and Blood of the Condor, you know, all these films that are amazing and that, that, that incredible period of film history. Um, and I just think it's really exciting that there are people, not just in Morocco, but, uh, you know, in other places around the world as well. There's a, a group in, in Mexico, um, for example, Um but also very much explicitly working in a third cinema tradition. So we are we are making third cinema. So so that's something that we wanted to draw attention to as well. And I think one of the interesting things that um, Nadir makes in that um, part of the book is uh, is just this. Uh, well, the title. What well, we ended up calling it the, the, the title of his piece, which is "We Need Critical Magazines, Debates, and Spaces." And I think that's another thing that's maybe missing from contemporary radical film culture at the moment is this, you know, this sort of zine culture. So if the RFN has a mailing list for everyone involved in it, can share ideas and all that and communicate and promote each other's work and, you know, on social media as well. But there's no, like, magazine or publication that's fairly, that's regular that, like there used to be. Like the IFA used to publish newsletters when it was around. Um, and that's, you know, that's just one example. But, like... I don't think radical film culture really produces that at the moment. There's no forum for it, should we say? Um, and I think that's something that um, Nadir is saying as well. Like we need debates, we need magazines, we need the spaces to talk about and promote this sort of stuff beyond like ourselves and beyond like the culture that um, that we kind of create and inhabit. Um, All right. Mm. Okay, before we go to the Radical Film Network or idea behind, I would like to uh, share your book, Where to Get. So we like to... That's, yep. uh, yeah, so that's uh, what you... So, yeah, so that's the... You can get 20% off. I think it's like 20 quid on Amazon. Um, or maybe it's 20 quid with that discount. I can't remember. Okay. Um, but you can also buy it direct from the publisher okay. and not, not give any money to Jeff Bezos. But um, okay. yeah, but, uh, anyway, I will share the link with uh, this video in any way. So I'm yeah, sure. yeah, do, do. I think you know it's a really. I think it's a, I, you know obviously I'm really proud of it. It was a lot of work putting it together, not just me, but of everyone, all the other contributors to the book. Um, that you know, it gives a really I think valuable insight into what you know, the state of radical film culture at the moment. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I hope it'll be a valuable thing. In fact, I was on a meeting the other day with a um, uh, guy in the Philippines, King Katoy, who runs um, the, the Video for Change network with Engage Media. And he was saying how useful it is to have this kind of research. So that's very encouraging <laughs> for people like me that write this stuff. All right, oh, it is useful, it is useful. Yeah, yeah of course it's a... Uh, you know, uh, useful because this research is not sake of research. It's, it's you're giving back actually yeah. to, uh, to organize. It's not just the sake of, you know, research. Here. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I mean, one of the challenges actually with the book is writing it, but one of the exciting things about it is that the Radical Film Network that the book has come from is a, like on a live project. It's, you know, it's not something that's been and gone and that we're writing about it retrospectively. It's changing all the time. And so it's very much like, you know, long term, we're all absolutely into, 
building the network for the long for the long term. I'm going to be doing this, you know, forever. Um, and so it's so it's always changing and developing, and I think that's really that's really exciting. And then hopefully, um, other people will will do other books that are also you know that the RFN can help like convene. In fact, Intellect, another publisher, got in touch with me recently to ask you know to say would you would you be interested in in a book series editing a book series where other people could come along and say well we want to write this book about radical film culture in scandinavia and then the publisher would 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 support them to do that so, so i All think right, there's okay. a lot more work left to do it's, it's yeah, sure, of course okay we need uh, now we'll go to radical film idea so because we want to organize a uh, talk tomorrow uh, and then i will yeah. we'll show what is radical film network basically so what is okay tell me in short what is idea behind rfm um and when is started and where yeah, sure. Uh, so there's, I guess there's three three kind of core ideas that underpin the Radical Film Network. So communication and collaboration among the, the people that are involved in the network to facilitate that, um, to connect up different generations of radical film culture activists and practitioners. And then thirdly, to promote the work that everybody in this culture does beyond the culture itself so to raise the visibility of everyone's work and i guess the principle behind it is that we're all greater than the sum of our parts i suppose and that um so so i mean to say a bit about where the network came from um so i was uh doing my phd uh researching the history of radical film in britain uh, and at the same time I co-founded with some friends and colleagues and comrades the Bristol Radical Film Festival. And so at the same time as I was doing this historical research, finding out about organisations like the Independent Filmmakers Association and, and what had come before us, I was also running a Radical Film Festival and finding out about what was happening right now in terms of like, the radical films that were being made and other radical film festivals all around the world and got to have quite a good sense of like who knew each other and who didn't know each other and who should know each other. So like, you know, different radical film festivals just in the UK that might, that weren't aware necessarily of each other. Um, radical video activists that were doing amazing work in Brighton, but didn't know the people in Glasgow doing it. And so, you know, it was quite a sort of unique and quite privileged vantage point really to be researching this work culture and working in it at the same time. And it was just really clear that we, you know, everybody involved, not just in the UK, but all around the world, needed some sort of network to help put us all in touch with one another and help support each other. And I think one of the reasons for that is because radical film culture isn't funded. By and large, the, all these organisations in the network, 200 odd organisations, don't get any funding. They're totally off the radar of the major film funders and film agencies. Um, so, so I think there's a real need for these organizations to, you know, support one another, however they can do it. So that was really the principle behind the network. We set it up in 2013. I wrote to, I don't know, about a hundred organizations and said like, this is the plan. I think, you know, would you be up for it? Um, we haven't got any money, but so what? We haven't got any money anyway. <laughs> so let's try and do it without any money. And, uh, and everyone wrote back and said, yes, please, that's a great idea. Why don't we do it? And then, um, so then I think about a year later, we uh, had the first conference in Birmingham. Um, and there was like 150 people came to that from all over the UK, but there was international people started turning up as well. And it was like, no, this is going international pretty quickly. Uh, and then at that conference, couple of people in glasgow were like we'll do the next one next year this is great and then so everyone decamped to glasgow the next year and then for glasgow someone was like i'll do the next one in dublin and then so and it's just sort of grown from then and and it's got and we've been in new york city with uh but like i said berlin um radical film network berlin had its first big meeting um last year they're going to do another one next year there's the RFN conference next year is going to be in Genoa in Italy to um commemorate in part to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the um uh, the anti-summit protest there where Carlo Giuliani was shot and killed murdered by the Italian police um so so yeah so 
Uh, so, yeah, well, I don't know where I was going with that, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of like where the network has come from and what it's, what it aims to do, really. All right. Okay, next question is, I mean, how you conducted these conferences, workshops, or what you have achieved, no. uh, you know, as, as for the students or filmmakers and academics, what what we have achieved so far? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, there's, I think there's a lot, actually. Um, but a lot of the time, I mean, there are some big things, but I think a lot of the times the, the value and the impact of the network is actually much smaller in terms of that it's about people feeling like they're not alone in terms of their politics or their film practice, whatever that's exhibition or curation or making films or feature films or video activism or whatever, or experimental movies. There's just a sense of putting people, building this sense of community internationally and that's the thing that whenever I ask people, like, oh yeah, you, how do you get involved with RFM? What do you think of it? They're always like, it's it's that feeling of solidarity that they get, and that feeling of like being part of this global community, but of other people that are doing the same kind of stuff that they are facing the same challenges, but also doing the same amazing work. Uh, and, and I think like a lot of the times, uh, in terms of the the wider impact of it, I'm not always privy to what impact the RFN is having because something somebody will post something on the on the mailing list like I'm really I'm looking for films about housing activism uh I'm you know this is a, a real life example I'm looking for films about um housing activism I've heard that uh I'd really like to get hold of this film Dispossession by Paul Sung um uh and we want to and then and then I was able to sort of through the network it's like yeah 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 we know Paul he's part of the network here's his film his email address connected up with him and he ended up taking his film to a convention of social housing activists in Poland where 40 organizations have come from all across Poland to talk about the need for social housing and that's so connecting up like international activist groups um but there's loads of examples like that um yeah so I think it's Probably, I think for me, like it's that sense of community and solidarity that's the the biggest, probably the, probably the biggest impact of the network. And then at the events that everybody does. Um, so I think in Berlin, there are fifteen hundred people come to the event in Berlin. Similar numbers came to the massive festival, they film festival they did in Glasgow. Um, yeah. All, all right. In the end, I would like to actually suggestions for the Nordic academic students or radical filmmaker to organize our, our radical film network. Any, yeah. do any it. motivation? Do it. Do it. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think first, slight start. Probably just start by, um, yeah, whoever it is, just start by writing, writing to make a make a little list of everyone you think you know should be there, and then write to them. Say, what do you think about this? And, and it's just even just doing that and the response that you will get, which you'll, you know, if there's anything like my experience, and I've been in touch with a lot of <laughs> radical film organisations, uh, everyone will be super pleased and really enthusiastic. I think, um, and yeah, to focus on those, start small, don't overcommit or whatever. I think the thing for us, I think was always like the network, try, we were trying to always keep the Radical Film Network as a network rather than as an organisation. That's uh, something that I talk a little bit about in my chapter in our book, that, um, that, that Radical Film Culture already has organisations that are sort of like, you know, predominantly unfunded based on volunteer labour and so on and so on. The last thing everybody needed was this another big layer of organisation to, to kind of try and maintain so i think the key for the up for the network has always been to be very decentralized very lightweight and to just try to provide the connective tissue if you like between existing organizations to just try and facilitate everyone else to be aware of and in touch with one another and to and to share each other's work um i think that's the other like major probably the major thing that the rfn does like i said at the start is it it sort of helps us all to support each other, which is a fundamental principle of like leftist principle, isn't it? Mutual aid, basically, and 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 yeah, uh, and supporting one another and showing solidarity. Um, and it's about like saying like, look, these people are doing amazing work. Like what you're doing, the Nordic Labour Film Festival, that's brilliant. So it's about creating a forum through which we can all promote each other's work. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay. And, uh, no worries. Hopefully, 
stay in touch. All right. Yeah, it's really, Take really care. Good to you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah. And yeah, and uh, you know, keep up more power to your elbow, as they say over Thanks. It. Keep it up. Nice one. Okay. to uh, moderate a conversation at the Nordic Labour Film Festival. I was uh, pleased to attend last year in person, so I'm uh, sort of sad to not meet people in person, but I think it's really fantastic uh, what the whole uh, team is doing this year with all of these very public online conversations. And so today uh, I've been asked to moderate a discussion about the possibility of sort of um, expanding or extending an organization, a network called the Radical Film Network to the Nordics, to Scandinavia. And so with me um, are Joshka Wessels. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, that's correct. Yes, okay. And... Uh, Carl, who will show up at my Sternstedt? Did I get that at all right? No. Svenstedt. Svenstedt. I'm sorry, I'm misreading yeah. my notes. Svenstedt. Okay. Welcome, Carl. Um, and you both have a, a kind of uh, teaching history in Malmo. Um, and so we'll, we'll just do a round of introductions, very brief, um, but kind of our background, work experience. And I think we all have done some work in and outside of the academy. And maybe as we talk about organizations and structures, this is something that we'll uh, discuss more. So um, my name is Benj Curtis, as you see below the screen. I have uh, experience as an artist, activist, writer, researcher, and teacher or professor. Um, I have a teaching career in the US and then in uh, 2018, moved to Sweden, and since then have been uh, teaching at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, and uh, am teaching uh, fine art students with an emphasis in moving image. And my own background comes out of uh, impulse and early video art, essentially, that uh, community media can be an experimental response to mass media and can be collectively produced, can have a kind of punk, do-it-yourself aesthetic. And so my most relevant experience for this panel probably comes out of doing independent media in the U.S. and uh, North America as part of the late 1990s, early 2000s anti-globalization movement and then after 2001, uh, anti-war protest movements in the US. So I was based in New York City for a long time, doing projects, often collaborating with community organizations uh, about migration, labor rights, um, and also organizing screenings and conversations at the intersection of culture and politics. And so um, if people have had a chance to watch the interview that Talat has done with Steve Presence, I think that one of the things that's important to note is that this Radical Film Network isn't just about production, but is really about exhibitions, uh, making collective practice more visible, screenings, discussion spaces. Um, so, yeah, I've been very interested in, in kind of making social movement media a more visible part of the conversation. Um, and in Sweden, I've been working on a video project with the cooperation of the Swedish Dock Workers Union, uh, about logistics and port labor. And that's um, something I've been working on for two years. So that's what brings me here. And uh, Joshka, let's hear from you next. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Benj. Um, my name is Joshka Vessels. I'm uh, originally Dutch, but I live in Sweden since 2011. Uh, my background is in ethnographic film and, and, and visual anthropology initially. Uh, but I also did some uh, broadcast traineeship prior to going into uh, academia and university. And um, my first sort of after graduation uh, uh, country that I lived for five years was Syria, where I did um, in 97, I, I lived in Aleppo for five years and I did uh, visual anthropological research on um, a small village in the north of Syria. Um, and also started to, to film there. So my, my PhD that came out of that is actually a combination of text, like a book, and, and three films. Um, 
in a country which then was very fringe, of course, and nobody really actually knew where Syria was. And then my background is also in Middle Eastern studies, so that's sort of my regional um, specialization. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I did that, and then I thought, okay, that's very nice, you know, academic work. But uh, let's let's just uh, try to do the pledge to poverty and uh, and spend uh, my time uh, uh, making independent uh, documentaries uh, on the Middle East, but also other areas. And I've worked for ten years uh, as an independent filmmaker, uh, freelance filmmaker from the UK, uh, where I freelanced for organizations like. Television Trust for the Environment, um, and some of my films came out on BBC World and, and Al Jazeera English, the Witness series, and, and I did a lot of other work in between as well. Um, I was a member of the, I still am a member of the European Social Documentary, so that's Documentaries for Social Change, uh, which is a great network, European-wide, um, which connects filmmakers that are working on this kind of social an environmental documentary. So for me, that was sort of my uh, my experience as a filmmaker, a freelance filmmaker. But at the same time, uh, somehow in 2011, I got drawn back into academia and I uh, I moved to Sweden, um, first in Lund University and now um, and then Copenhagen, and now I ended up in Malmo. Um, I did two postdocs, one on uh, again with film, but more on sort of um, the um, the Jordan River basin. Um, and, and hydropolitics and water, which was one of the major sort of issues that I actually did my, my couple of my last films about for Al Jazeera English. Uh, but then um, Syria happened and already we had a bit of a talk before this. It's like, so it's suddenly in 2011, everybody knew where Syria was and what Syria was. And so, um, and of course, I was very much involved in also my contacts there, particularly among the filmmakers community. Uh, documentary filmmakers community in 2006 they they had the Docs Box Festival in Damascus which I followed and, and I had a network of friends there um, and most of them they they became video activists and, and and joined the uprising and joined the the earlier sort of demonstrations and um, so that became really the focus of my um, between you know after uh, yeah after my time in Lund um, so I've, I've been really um, researching that as well, specifically also the north of Syria, so from Aleppo city and, and, and Aleppo province, but also Raqqa. Um, and that turned out into a book project, um, of which the book came out in 2019, last year, uh, which is called Documenting Syria, which is basically documenting the the, the documentary history of documentary film from Syria by Syrian directors from the 19, late 1960s until until now, until sort of, you know, so the, the three phases of sort of earlier documentary, dissident documentary, and then, you know, what happened between 2000 and 2011, and then 2011, of course, uh, was, it's, a, it's a whole part of the book as well. And so that that is really my interest, and we were just talking about you know some of the some of the organizations that are in the radical film mm -hmm. network and and just last month we had a discussion also with isodoc uh, at a conference uh, for the new isodoc batch I, I did isodoc 10 years ago is that there's a lot of things happening which is just off the radar of commissioning editors or festivals which is amazing i mean and like yeah. you know, when, yeah. when you when you've seen the interview with steve it's like you know there's so much out there Mm -hmm. and, and and the radical film network really touches upon something that uh, you know to connect to connect these uh, the, the these amazing initiatives that are that are happening and continue to happen. So I, I think it's really exciting to talk about you know something yeah. uh, setting that up here in, in the Nordics. Let's pick that up in a minute. Let's give. Uh, yeah. I'd like to hear Carl introduce himself as well, and then we can circle back around and discuss that further. Yes, thank you. Uh, Paul Henrik Svenste. Um, it's a very nice company. I'm grateful to be here. And um, I think this uh, project, Arbita Film and all around it, is uh, fabulous. Just because we did kind of the same thing once in the late 60s. And uh, very nice memories come back. Actually, 
I started out as a writer. Uh, my first book was uh, an anti-war book, eventually called War. Where's the camera? Here. War. Here, Krieg. Uh, and uh, three years later, I made my first film. In the States, actually. I had a very nice scholarship that allowed me to travel all over the States. And I traveled from independent filmmakers to independent filmmakers. And I dare say I met them all. And that was really a kick. So when I came back, there was a movement starting, like Talat's movements, um, with young communists. And I was a hippie. Uh, <laughs> long hair, mustache, and, yeah. uh, and, and white trousers. So the, the interesting thing was that we joined forces, uh, a very radical political organizer and a free artist. And we stayed together and started Film Centrum, which still uh, exists still today. And uh, uh, he's certainly the, the oldest uh, free filmmaker aggregate that I know of. Uh, we made some very basic and very fundamental experiences in starting. At that time, in, in 68, there ex existed no distribution, diffusion for shorts or other things than Igmar Bergman films. Bergman was a pope, as we mentioned. Uh, and we are Bergman enemies, mind you, dangerous people. Um, so uh, we started to uh, uh, find out where there existed 16 millimeter projectors in the country. And we found 21,000. <laughs> and, and this uh, nice communist guy, he, uh, he had a cathodic with uh, cards for all these 21,000 uh, projectors. Yeah. And then we started approaching the organization, uh, labor organization, mm -hmm. cultural organizations, schools, education, etc. Uh, and kind of checked out uh, in which way we could re start reaching them and build up an independent film net. I can tell you that at a certain point uh, of our lousy economy, we went all the way up to Olof Palme, uh, the prime minister. <laughs> and uh, he asked me what, what we wanted to say, money. <laughs> and, uh, because we couldn't go to the film institute, they were big yeah. enemies. Yeah. So yeah. we sat in front of uh, Palme, and then Sven, the, uh, what, what should I call him, the Bolshevik, mm. showed him the cathartic with all the cards. And Palme said, give it to me. But Sven was quicker and fetched it and took it back and said, give me the money first. And then he turned to the Secretary of State and said, how much do we have, Sven, uh, uh, John? Yeah. Uh, 35,000 Swedish crowns. Give it to them. I'll take the cards. So, <laughs> but he didn't get it. We got the money, but he didn't get it because... It was such a powerful pack yeah. of information, you know. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah. with that money, we uh, rented uh, uh, a place, mm -hmm. a basement, and uh, started organizing, or organizing the distribution and published and had, um, what do you call it, a call-up for people. And hell of a lot of people came to that meeting. It was in May of uh, 68. And that was the basis of our organization. And that was filmmakers of all kinds, except the commercial ones. They yeah. did it there, actually. Okay. 
what we did was we organized the distribution using the 21,016 mil projectors, simply said. And here comes the first experience, which is basic. If you want to have the same organization, don't mix money. Because I had seen in the States that where the co-ops co -ops were mm -hmm. starting to fall apart already. Mm -hmm. uh, Canyon Cinema, mm -hmm. uh, Filmex Coop, mm -hmm. and, and all these people I met. And they had another idea, and I said, do it like um, in Las Vegas. You, you, you join the game with your film and your money. And we will organize distribution of it for a mm -hmm. very modest sum. And it's up to you to do the work. That's the first important experience for starting that kind of network. The other one is do not, no, do mm -hmm. always start from the local network. No. Let the local network organize your screen. Don't come as a, as a heavy guy from Stockholm and teach them, right? right. Teach right. and manage. Yeah. 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 And out of these two things, everything went fine. In my own career as filmmaker, I have made classical documentaries. We also started, after that, we started uh, the People's Cinema, which was based on uh, theatrical distribution. And they still existing and marching fine, so we have a number of cinemas of our own, let's say. Anyway, um, I started out in Europe, and I concentrated on Europe and the very heavy political things that were happening uh, in France, in Italy, uh, mainly. And the film that you are going to see Saturday afternoon was the first film. It's called uh, Workers' Power, and it was about this immense movement when the workers tried to organize unions outside of the gigantic hierarchical system that existed in Italy, for example, and who were basically Soviet organizations, actually. So then started the movement of the, the um, autonomy mm -hmm. in the universities. Mm -hmm. And in, on lucky occasions, these two met. And that's the theme of the film that they will project uh, this uh, Saturday, Saturday yeah. evening. I, I'm still active. Uh, nobody gave me money anymore, but you know, with one digital, <laughs> digital technology, we can do it <laughs> anyway. So, um, yeah. I'm still active. yeah, that's it. And I write books. No. So, I mean, in a way, we, we were um, discussing what we can do with this radical film network idea, but you have given us a history that precedes the network, right? So there, there have always been these attempts, and I know some in the U.S. as well, to, to set up alternative cooperatives or distribution with projectors or um, kind of mailing lists or catalogs or funding schemes that are take up different ways. So this is a really beautiful history you've shared, and I look forward to seeing this film. Um, and I guess what's interesting is that uh, perhaps the three of us are based in Sweden, but that we have experience from Italy and elsewhere in Europe. We have experience from Syria. Um, I And the U.S., you've traveled uh, before I was born, which is uh, quite exciting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not that I was born, but just that this this history of like, uh, but by the time I met all these organizations that you're mentioning, they were very, very uh, dusty, right? So the, the sort of early radical, more sort of... Uh, I think exciting moment for a lot of these organizations you witnessed in a way that I only have read about and imagined. You know, there was one very basic thing to say about these days. 
and that was the Olofalb system. We yeah. were neither Moscow, neither Washington, which mm -hmm. gave us access mm -hmm. to freedom and liberation movements all over the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that was, that was a political basis. Mm -hmm. But I think that Talat and friends again will come to a virgin country. There's very much to do in Sweden. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And uh, we made this little interview yesterday. Yeah. And you can hear more about it there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe we just frame that question that we see on the screen now, which is that there is this idea from the interview that Talat has done with Steve Presence about the Radical Film Network as a kind of concept, as a premise. Uh, what, what can we learn from that, as you say, Carl, particularly in Sweden? I think it's uh, a thing that we kind of missed. Uh, in these days, and that is that you have this connection to the uh, academic life and to research mm -hmm. and uh, uh, facts, writing, publishing, etc. Uh, I think there is uh, an enormous power among the students in Sweden of today, but it's sleeping. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we we talked about that a little bit before before we had this this um, discussion. Now, um, I think that was one of the strong points of the interview with Steve is that it came from, you know, uh, a practice based academic who actually reaches out, and 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 this is how I could see, you know, how we could sort of. When we when we talk about what the idea behind the radical film network also in the Nordics would be, is that if you have a sort of, you know, the idea of connecting different not only different generations because I think that was great in the in the in the interview as well when you'd say, you know, you had the independent filmmakers organization in in the UK that he found when he was doing his PhD, and perhaps we need to have a PhD who is actually <laughs> going to look at. Uh, your experience, Carl, in you know, in in Sweden, I don't know if someone has done a PhD on it, but it would be really a great uh, subject on, you know, what is happening, what has been happening with this, you know, the twenty, <laughs> the twenty one thousand project, sixty millimeter projections, and how it's used in distribution. This is already something to learn from, us, and then generations to connect the younger generations with that. That's one idea that we can think we can. We can learn from from, uh, from the Radical Film Network, but also this collaboration and the collaboration between academics, between uh, between uh, uh, distributing, you know, uh, people who are in the distribution in festivals, but definitely, of course, the creators, uh, and and then that could mean, you know, that we that we that we can sort of forge that network really, so as a sort of bridge between these two. Worlds, academia, and and the practice, and 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 for I mean for Malmo University, I'm I'm based at Communication for Development and, and K3, and, and, and like I said, you know this this is very much a practice based uh, research uh, sort of group. So you know all of us have also a background in, uh, or most of us have, have a background as a, a practitioner and an academic. But I think that is definitely what Carl said. Know, which we could sort of learn from mm -hmm. and maybe take you know on future ideas or ideas about the radical film network in the Nordics I mean I think one of the things also that really struck me with what Steve was talking about was was about making certain practices that already exist that are under yeah. funded under resource making them more visible right to, yeah. to kind of make people know that they're part of a transnational solidarity network um, that it's not you know, if you're off the radar, that doesn't mean that you're not having an impact, right? And I think that um, maybe this is a shift from the history that Carl is giving us as well, is that, the, you know, there's this very long history that various kind of collectives are trying to, uh, at least in the U.S., it's cable access or open a canal and they sort of get, get cable time or satellite time or find ways to distribute work. And now, of course, these networks are highly commercialized, they're privatized, but, but the, the actual means for producing and distributing are much cheaper than they were in some ways, right? So, so it does seem like sometimes the questions of production 
it's not as much about finding a place to process the film or to get funding for these things, but it's more about actually helping work that is being made somewhere reach an audience that's not in that point geographically, you know, and to sort of find ways of this network of affinity, right, between different practices, right? Uh, the, 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 the crucial uh, question, evidently, is reaching out. No. And uh, you will see uh, in my film there that for a, for a certain time between 1969 and 1971, and in 1971 in Italy, the, the, sh the shooting started. No. Red Army uh, and, things, yeah. and, and all went. Yeah. yeah. So, but um, there is a meeting between academics and yeah. workers. Yeah. Yeah. There is a meeting in uh, Mestre, which is the, mm -hmm. the chemical area, mm -hmm. industrial mm -hmm. area, between Tony Negri and his um, doctorates from uh, the university and the union leader, Sproglio, mm -hmm. from um, the petrochemical industry. And then you can see academics and workers, union uh, laborers, sitting at the same table, discussing the workers' deal that is up for discussion. And behind the, the large union. It's a very interesting moment, mm -hmm. and it just work, uh, shows that it's possible. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. Uh, if I can say one thing more, my, yes. my, my young daughter, she works with the People's Cinema yeah. as di uh, distributing shorts. Yes. And in the car one day, she told me how she worked. And she said, yeah, I work in information. And then she, t she told me how she reaches the, um, the places where the things mm -hmm. will be shown. And it's so different from yesterday. So I said, you don't work with information. You don't have something to say that you want to bring over to this other person. Your job is dialogue. The media is so swift and so subtle that mm -hmm. you, anybody can get any film out from her discussing it, choosing, mm -hmm. picking, and screening according mm -hmm. to their needs, not to my needs as a yeah. distributor. That's yeah. fundamental. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I, there's also this question that you see splashing on the screen. So we should, because because I think part of it is as again, it's not just the network; it's also the conditions for really discussing discussing this work and discussing what mm -hmm. it means to try to have a radical film practice these days, right? Which is not something we can take for granted. It should always be kind of open for reinvention and questioning. But I think there is this very pragmatic question of, can we propose academic conferences to kind of expand the Radical Film Network in Sweden? And I think uh, Joshka and I were talking before we started recording, we really think that um, as my understanding is the most interesting and relevant and impactful labor organizing now is very much happening in a cross-border sense. You know, gig economy, warehouse work, logistics, these are the fields that I've uh, kind of worked in, that it's all cross-border and about people who are slipping through the cracks of national labor organizations. I think we really want to think about this as a Scandinavian or Nordic project, not just a Swedish one. I think there's a lot to do in Sweden, but the more you pick at that, it connects to Denmark, it connects to Norway. To yeah. Finland as well. So, so the question is, what are the resources that we, in our institutional capacities, might be able to draw upon to perhaps, let's say, share some of these resources with projects from less well-resourced nations, but also to really build the network here in a way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so do either of you have specific thoughts about this? Uh, I'm uh, I'm thinking about the uh, expression radical. How does it ring to a Swedish ear? What does it tell us? Not no. much, actually. No, it's not like in uh, like in Italy or or in mm -hmm. France uh, that radical is radical. 
So um, uh, one has to consider the uh, understanding of the basic terms, actually, and one has to explain it, I think, to the audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what was interesting, what uh, Steve was saying about radical film culture, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a real concept, so radical film culture and activism. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we, we talked about this before, like it does need to be, if we do any conference, I think it does need to be transnational, you know, going into Norway, Denmark, Finland, and also, you know, that, that could also give opportunities to see whether we can get some funding. Um, because I think that radical film culture and especially activism and, and films for change, for social change, you know, particularly, I mean, there's lots of really interesting work going on in Norway as well. And it's about making this visible and not only within, of course, the labor network and the labor issues and challenges. And, and, and of course, now we're with the Nordic Labor Film Festival, but also on issues of, you know, films being made about AI, about, you know, drone warfare, about these kind of very strongly, uh, um, you know, films that are particularly made for change, so for activism, activists, and, and connecting activist scholars, if you like, as well, because, you know, this, this, this is also something that... Uh, um, that you would have in this kind of conference where you would, you have an academic conference on what is radical film culture, right. but at the right. same time being able to, you can even combine it with a sort of radical film festival uh, where you would screen some of the films of the filmmakers that go. come. And I'm thinking of, because a couple of years ago when I was still postdoc at Copenhagen, I invited Tonya Shea to Copenhagen to show her film about drone. and. And that was in 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 a in an academic workshop, and then we had a debate. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there to think of a, a program that could be put together uh, um, as, as some kind of, of, of conference in in a year's time. And I think there's a lot of opportunity, and that we that we from our positions at the different institutions that we and our networks, I think yeah, then you you cover already a lot a lot of <laughs> ground in that sense. And even installations, you know, if you're working on yeah. um, on short uh, films or video art or things like that, I think you can go pretty broad. But I also think it's, you know, working with younger students, it's also about uh, making yeah. model visible, right? And, and the more different contexts yeah. you can pull in and say, like, here's an interesting model, here's an interesting model. Because um, obviously they're exposed to, as Carl was saying, like there's the kind of, the film institute or the Hollywood or the mainstream model. And it's actually a very sort of yeah. small square box that these things have to fit into. And as yeah. Joshka and I were discussing earlier, I mean, this kind of festival circuit and the funding things, the idea that things need to premiere at a festival. If you're involved in a kind of activist struggle, it may take a very long time to finish a film, but you're probably not going to want to wait to kind of hold a premiere, right? You And so increasingly we see groups that release little chunks of things here and there. And so I think these other ways of working that aren't always long form, um, that may yeah, and, be more and also, kind of popular outreach or super interesting to talk about, yeah. Yeah, and, and definitely with the digital means. I mean, uh, I mean yeah. there's also with the funding, I mean, crowdfunding that is happening, yeah. you know, film, you don't need to have you know, and sell your soul to a commissioning editor mm -hmm. of the National Film Institute anymore, when you can set up a crowdfunding campaign and then, you know, fund your own film and then and then distribute it in digital, you know, digital platforms. You don't need to go to a cinema. I mean, this is, and, and, and also I think the younger generation, it is changing. I mean, the way, you know, this kind of, of content and this kind of material is being consumed is different. It's going to be different in 10 years, 20 years time. I mean, how, how many, uh, and, and I think that is also, it, it, that needs to be discussed in one of these conferences. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had the 21, I, I think this is great, the 21,060 millimeter projector. Yes, amazing. Because yeah. yeah. so that is like, okay, but now we have YouTube. You know, it's like, this is, <laughs> so, I, and, and we have like mobile phones and people have like, yeah. so it, it's, but that, in itself is already a PhD project, you know. But I think there's also this question, I mean, I, I have a lot of students who are not interested in flying for eco ecological reasons, right? And so yeah. I think there's also this question of how do we create political or activist media collaborations that don't use this old model of a European filmmaker who travels around the world and visit, but actually like we need, 
groups and different pockets who are able exactly. to use the digital networks to communicate, right? And, and collaborative filmmaking, uh, yeah. you know, and, and also film, you know, like we're talking about Bida Yats, but there was, mm -hmm. there was also a really interesting initiative that I that I found when I was doing my postdoc with, with Syrian filmmakers is the, the Mobile Phone Film Festival, mm -hmm. and they have some great shorts yeah. just made by a mobile phone, by people like from the ground up, what, what Carl was saying, you know, you need to not, you need to go from the local initiative. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's really uh, exciting to to you know in this to to connect these two. A, a lot of very basic uh, things are coming up. When I went back, thanks to the quarantine, by the way, um, <laughs> to work um, to find out what our early films were li like, I found one very interesting thing. That is. Political films are not made the way me, we made it, because uh, uh, there are fabulous political films being made today, but they are always out for uh, a person, a story, uh, a crime, a political uh, uh, mistake or things like that. We always started with structures yeah mm. uh, class against class uh, and things like that yeah, yeah. and uh, <laughs> i think we had better to go back to some yeah. of these issues because no, they I, are I very that, burning <laughs> i think yeah. that this is absolutely the thing we need to work on is how do we address structures right because yeah. this what gets made is character stories. I mean, in the US, funders will say, we don't fund issues, we fund stories, right? Exactly. We, and who are your personal, yeah. we, want to, we want to meet her, we want to meet him. And uh, if you don't play that game, you just don't get out there. And I think that if you're trying to deal with structural change, yeah, it's not about one or two protagonists, it's about how do we deal with this big question and how do we invent a form and a way of working with others that could actually tackle that. And it's a, it's a harder problem, right? But I, I think it's one that we should take on together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me sh uh, show you the, uh, where are we? Meanwhile, back in the streets is, is uh, the title. Yeah. <laughs> of uh, yeah. the, four, the, the, the four films from the yes. 19, 1960s. Yes. Okay. And there is this uh, this demonstrating workers. Hey, there, two men and a woman. Yeah. yeah. And when I showed that to young fellow, yeah. he, sa he said, "Who's she?" And one never looked for the name of the guys who were in front on a demonstration because it was a moment mm -hmm. you know and and uh, that that was not that we kind of dumped them or something but it was the film was not about that mm -hmm. structure. yeah yeah, yeah structure is collective but I, but I also think, I mean, I, I happened to have a meeting with uh, SAC, the syndicalists, yesterday in Stockholm. Oh, yeah. they're, really, they're trying to really increase their podcasting and video, but part of this for them is about language. And, you know, if you are coming to Sweden from somewhere else and uh, basically sort of excluded from certain rights and protections on the basis of status or employment uh, to, to do a lot of translation into a bunch of languages, right? Um, and I think that this this festival is taking this on as well of like what, you know, who are the workers today and how do we actually create a conversation between, because capital is very effective in creating these divisions, right? And, um, you know, I, I know, for example, the, the trend on these huge uh, shipping vessels that Maersk runs is to get six or eight people who don't speak the same language so they can't organize, right? Uh, they can speak bad English, they can eat together, they can run the ship, but they won't speak well enough uh, at the outset to actually know how to collectivize, right? So we have to actually do that work because the, there are structures that are creating those social divisions, right? The, syn the syndicalists are very interesting in, yes. uh, in, in our political landscape, and it's not by chance that they organize the people at the radio and television. Yeah. Okay. They are, they are, they are strong yes. there. Even yes. maybe even yeah. the strongest uh, union. And but they, uh, 
They also are interested in media as a way to reach yeah. beyond their normal base, to reach people who wouldn't who wouldn't identify as militant or radical, right? So I think this is to go back to your question, it's like, you know, this word for some of us may be a kind of a culture, right? Like radical is a, a calling card, but for others we want to suggest that it it's radical in that there's a, a pretty heavy control in terms of what uh what you see in other outlets, right? And that this is this is a place where we try to kind of expand the horizon for those things. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it has gone so far, I would say, that the, the proletariat in Sweden are uh, the immigrants. Because mm -hmm. the, the um, trained, educated, working people, they are now middle class. And usually they are uh, their own little company. Even. So it's a tricky business. Yeah. Very much for everything. I think we, um, this is just a start. I mean, we need to carry on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, some small scale, maybe we can do it in next, I you mean, know, when we're getting out from the pandemic and then we plan a bit bigger. So it's a step by step thing. It's not uh, we can jump to the. So big, mm. big thing. But is there, Talat, is there a way that uh, anyone who watches this, because Joshka and I were talking before we started recording about specific funds and how to organize some sort of public assembly after we hopefully pass this uh, pandemic impasse. Yeah. But if people see this and want to be involved, uh, do they contact you or how do, how do we build this beyond the four of us? Uh, I think we, uh, we think like this. Um, so we want to do, um, obviously, we have more people in our mind, I mean, uh, who are radical, mm -hmm. radical filmmakers or academics. So we mm -hmm. need to uh, to build kind of, I think, like a mailing list or something to start kind of debate. Uh, I think that's a step forward for us. And uh, we can have, maybe we can have online meetings a couple of times, yeah. maybe every second month or month. So yeah. maybe that kind of thing we can do. Mm -hmm. And then we can propose, I mean, we, if we, not probably early summer, uh, or not early next year, but I mean, maybe after the summer, we can propose a small conference, probably maybe Sweden, Stockholm, or uh, Gothenburg. Or, I mean, we have more uh, actually academics. They are interested, but uh, right. time it was not matching to to bring them everyone to the same platform, same time. So uh, okay. this is an, a beginning. So I think we can go step by step for that. Yeah, great. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. For yeah, well, very happy to be a part of this and uh, international, intergenerational, super... Uh Super gives, interesting. Uh, super interesting and gives me kind of energy and hope when we have these conversations. So thank you.